a real privilege to have him here today. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Oh! Oh, wow. Applause. I never got that when I was working here for a living. Thank you very much. I see there's a group of really interested students here, and then there's like a no man's land right here in the middle here. And then, then we have the rest. We'll see what happens. Okay, I'd like to, before I get where I'm going to talk about reliability. That's extremely important, and it's never discussed in any of the other courses, but so we, we want to make sure when we design things that they're reliable. That kind of makes sense. So we're going to talk about that in, in some detail. Uh, first of all, a couple of things about the course, just my impressions about the course when I, uh, now I took it over from Dr. Woods, and Dr. Woods was a, a genius in teaching. Uh, he retired in 2000, unfortunately passed away last year. Uh, but he taught a lot of us about teaching and enthused the students and the faculty members. So a lot of what's in the course is really coming from Dr. Woods and I did the PowerPoints you know, and stuff like that. He did the thinking. Um, the course is unique in, in several respects, which I think you've already seen. One of them that's very important is that we, we're dealing with professional skills as well as technical knowledge. And where, whenever you talk to companies and employers and you talk about people in, in placement centers, the, the idea of skills comes up all the time. And really, that's what differentiates a really top graduate from a good graduate, is the skills. So, so working on, on doing them both, I know sometimes we, we de-emphasize them in most courses, you derive equations, you calculate numbers, and you get an A. And skills get left behind. So it's important that we do it here. Uh, the other thing is, is that if we compare this course to, say, 3G, in 3G you were developing a base calculation for the entire plant. I hear you had a big project, really big project. Well, with Dr. Adams, you're sure to get a big project. And a good one, though, a good one. And so you were doing that base calculation. And what we're really doing now is saying that point is very important, but it's probably never going to occur exactly in reality. Things change all the time. That feed material that you think you're going to get, you're not going to get that. And equipment's going to break down, and heat exchangers are going to fall. So how do we design not only to do the base point, but how do we respond to all the variabilities that can occur, including when things break? So that's going to come up now in, in reliability. And then when you do safety, that's really, really important. The course, you've calculated like crazy, right? You've, I don't know how many equations you've solved and how many equations you've derived. And in this course, there's really not that much of that going on. The, the mathematics and economics was trivial. I mean, you could have done that in high school. So, so we're not doing a lot of math here. So what are we doing? Well, we're looking at process structures and process equipment and how we put the things that we know together in the proper structures so they're going to work. So we're not doing a lot of math. And since sometimes you're, you're really primed for math, if I showed you a calculation, you'd eat it up, right? And you know how to do that. So now you have to kind of change your mindset a little bit and talk about structures. And then finally, let me do a little plot here. This is time, OK? And we'll say this is time from when you completed engineering economics. So the rest of the course from about a week ago. And over here, we're going to have a happiness scale. Okay, so that's, that's moderate. Okay, down here is, here is, what's the general trajectory that happens in this course? <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. <laughs> It doesn't go like <laughs> the guy in the red t-shirt, he's, he's a troublemaker. I know it. I can tell that. But it doesn't, it doesn't usually, the happiness scale doesn't normally start off the way we 
we'd like. It starts to go like this. Because what's happening? You've been given a big project, a project that one or two of you cannot do. You actually have to have a team. Now, we've formed teams before, but any two students could have done the 4L2 lab, right? Or the 3L2 lab together. We just threw a bunch of you together, but we did, you didn't need everybody. You know, one of them could have died or something, and you would have still, <laughs> still, maybe somebody did in one of your labs. And, and still, you would have passed. Right? You could have gotten an A. But that's not true here. So now we're, we're, we're working very intensively on all these interpersonal skills, and you have a very ill-defined project. That's not, that's not a recipe for immediate happiness. However, the good news is, for most people, we start to turn the corner. And as we start, we get maybe about here is the first progress meeting. And in the first progress meeting, you're not going to know all the answers, but you're going to start understanding the questions. And you're going to have some of the answers, and then some, some of the time you're, you're not going to know where to go. And that's why we're have, you'll have a meeting. So that each group will have different questions and, and understand different things. So there has to be some individual coaching that's going on. So, and then we're going to get up here. And boy, when you finish that project and you turn in your report, you're going to be so proud of it that you're going you're to be off the scale on the happiness. So what we have to deal with here is, is that we don't, you know, we, we don't get too depressed if we see that the course is really going to be demanding and it's going to be so much different from the other courses that we've had. So the difference is really the good part of the course. You know, we can, we can run through equations and do simulations, and, uh, but it won't have the, the big benefit, the big bang we're going to get here. Okay, so I don't, I don't know. If we had clickers, we don't have clickers. I could ask you where you are on the scale here. But I could do it with a show of hands, but nobody would admit where they are. Okay, so th keep that in mind if you, at some point, uh, stop first. Naturally, you have to stop it when it stopped, and then you can go. Now, to stop it, do I have to push go? <laughs> okay, that should be good enough. Now, ah. you have a handout with most of the slides without the answers. There's a lot of answers, questions that we're going to work through during the class, and you don't have the answers. A couple of places, because I, I always change things at the last minute. There are a couple of things that are changed from the handout, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, post, the, we'll post the solutions. Or post, post the PowerPoint, which will include the solutions and any changes that were made. All right, so the idea behind the whole course from an engineering perspective, the technical knowledge perspective, is to take this which is sort of like a 3G4 pro, uh, product, and turn it into something that actually is going to work. Okay? And then do the economics and, and do the safety and do everything else around it. So here's reliability. So do you consider reliability when you make a purchase yourself? So pretty soon you're going to be so wealthy, you're going to have so much money, you're, not, you know, you're going to graduate and, you know, People are going to give you credit cards. I mean, so you're going to buy a car. So are you going to look at consider reliability when you buy the car? Hopefully, hopefully, yeah. So all of these things can happen. What happens if it's a snowy road and it breaks down? So there's a, there's a lot of costs associated with low reliability. Now, you might be a risk taker, right? So you may decide to buy a, uh, not be a risk taker and, and buy a Honda which never breaks down. I had one that never breaks down. You don't have to do anything to it. Or you may buy a sportier car with a little less reliability. By the way, these are, these are all the muscle cars from the 60s. They were awful. I mean, they broke down. You couldn't get out of the driveway with these things. Uh, that's why General Motors went out of business. So we need reliability. That's very important. 
So let's just talk about a, a, a word definition. We'll look at a little equation a little bit later. Uh, so we're sure of what we mean by reliability. So it's a probability that an item can perform its intended function for a specific interval under specified conditions. Okay, so it's a probability, first of all. There is no such thing as 100% reliable, and hopefully there's no such thing as 0% reliable. Um, it's intended function. So when you're doing a design, you will specify, I want to be able to make product over this range. Not at this point, the point's in the range. I have to be able to produce maybe 70% of the design value and 100%, 110% of the design value. And with different, a range of feedstocks, different coals or different iron ores or different concentra uh, monomer concentration of impurities. And so we have to define that range over a specific interval of time. So what is that time? How do we know what the time is? It's, the plant may exist for 40 years or 50 years or 100 years even, some chemical plants. They just, we just keep changing it as we go along. So what's the time that we're really concerned with between when we actually sh we shut the whole plant down and do maintenance on the whole plant and make modifications? So that's sometimes called a turnaround. And that might occur every six months to maybe every two years. So we would like our plant to be reliable over that time period, for sure. For sure. We, don't, we, we would like to have no breakdowns, but we may have some. Probably will have some, as a matter of fact. So the time is the interval uh, between turnarounds. If it's batch, we may say a certain number of batches. Right. So turnarounds can be shorter than that. If you're in the food manufacturing or the pharmaceuticals, you have to shut down more often to clean the plant. Blast caustic through it and steam and make sure that you're not going to kill your customers you know, with something that's growing in there that shouldn't be growing in there. So it can be shorter. Uh, the longest would be something like a petroleum refinery that might be several years. Several years, so it's got to work well for several years. Okay, and under stated conditions. Yeah, we're, we, we can't have infinite temperature and infinite pressure, so this, the, the expected conditions. If we get outside of those conditions, things, bad things may happen. So we, one of our activities will, in our design is to make sure we stay inside that window of allowable conditions. And we'll do that both in reliability and in safety. If we get outside those conditions, bad things can happen. The equipment could break down, that's bad. That's bad for your career. Worse than that, somebody can get injured or killed, right? Because if we get too far outside of the, the design conditions. So we have to, when we're designing our plant, we have to know, know these things very well. <clears throat> Just to put reliability and safety in perspective, safety is more important. So if we have a situation in which there's an initiating cause and it's somewhere through the process effects and the consequences, we get a potential hazard, that's safety. And I am not talking about those situations. That will come next, next for several weeks. And while a lot of what we'll see in, in uh, reliability also applies to safety, the, the analysis is unique to the safety problem. And here, in, in the reliability, some bad things can happen, and it'll cost us some money, but nobody's going to get hurt. And we're not going to dump 100,000 barrels of oil into the river. So that, now we're over into reliability. So in reliability, it's an economic balance. Reliability is an economic balance. Safety, we set a standard for safety and we're gonna spend whatever it takes to get to that standard, okay? So everything I'm saying now is below that black line. We're into the economic trade-offs. Everybody see that? 
So another motivation is cost. So we're into the cost issue. Uh, this is a nice little picture that I stole from somebody, although I gave him credit in the chapter, uh, saying that here's your, your purchase cost for equipment. And you know, here's the Titanic saying, boy, that doesn't look very big. You know, and here's the, the cost for over the 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years we're going to operate the plant of all of the operation costs. And so I've given some examples here. Now, which ones of these are, would be related to reliability? Which one of those in, those, in that table, which cost would be associated with reliability? Yes? Spare parts. Spare parts. Okay, so definitely spare parts. Any other ones? All of them to some extent, because if something breaks down, we may consume more fuel. But dominating maintenance, equipment replacement. So the, the dominant ones are on the right here. And then some of the consequences will f could fall over into the, into the other operating costs. So over here is sort of the dominant factors in, in reliability. So again, we're going to talk about when things happen. It's not safety related, but it's bad, and we want to prevent them. If we can't prevent them, we have to recover from them. OK, so what are we going to do? We're going to take a very quick and a talk about quali qualitative aspects of, of reliability, very quick. Then we're going to talk about data and models. Then you'll see some equations. I know you need equations every day. Otherwise, you get malnourished. And then we'll talk about models. And so what the models will be for certain structures of things, because at this level, data and models, we could teach this ex exact same uh, material to electrical engineers and mechanical engineers. For different structures of things, we have different reliabilities. So what, what are good structures and what are not so good structures of things? Once we understand that, then we're going to get the heart of chemical engineering, which is how do we take that information and develop some concepts about design uh, of equipment and process plants. Okay. So this is generic. There's chemical engineering. Then uh, a few words on maintenance. Now, maintenance is really not a design issue. But I'm going to have just a couple slides on maintenance because it's so important. There are a couple of key ideas that would be nice for you to know when you leave here and go out to work. And then we're going to talk about uh, using the economics, the stuff you just learned. Uh, you learned it, right? Yeah, OK. So we're going to apply this now to how do we do this trade-off. There are some special ways that we're going to formulate the profitability problem so that we can account for reliability. And we're going, to see, we're going to apply this economics to a couple of the structures that we developed up here. Because these structures will say, well, we could do this, or we could do that, or we could do another thing. Then we do the economics to say, OK, let's compare them and find out what the best one is from an economic point of view. But not just looking at equipment, but looking at what's the cost of failures. So we're going to have to include the extra equipment and then what savings, what kind of savings do we make if we have this extra equipment? Yeah, and then all of this goes into your course project, because we're not going to have a quiz, and we probably won't do the workshops. But that's OK, because you have a big project to work on. All right, very quickly. I want to go over these very quickly. Um, so the factors affecting. Uh, yep, here's a change. I made a change up here. So this line is different from your handout. Um, what are the things that affect reliability in a qualitative sense? Well, if you, if, you, if you match your equipment to the process needs, that's very good, and you're going to have high reliability. If it doesn't match, you're going to have low reliability. That's a philosoph I've just made a philosophical statement, and you should say, prove it. Show me an example. OK, well, we'll have one. We'll have a couple of them a little later. Then the process operating conditions uh, certainly affect reliability. 
if, especially if we get outside that window, that's bad. We get outside that window, it says, well, the, the equipment works here, and it doesn't work outside that window. Uh, we have to make sure we stay inside the window, but sometimes things happen. Uh, equipment faults, errors by personnel. So, <clears throat> have you talked much about errors with personnel yet? Yeah. Okay. So, so it's really important to consider the fact that people make mistakes. Now, Professor Don has never made a mistake. His entire life, he's never made a mistake. What about you? And except signing up for chemical engineering, you, you're a mistake. So, no. And, and there's lots of little experiments where there's a, like a green button and a red button. And you say, press the green button, and somebody presses the green button. Press the red button. You know, within a hundred times, somebody put, they push the wrong button. So, so mistakes happen a lot, and we have to make sure in our designs that we, we can be robust to those mistakes. Certainly that they don't hurt anybody, and also that hopefully we don't lose uh, uh, a lot of money. And I'm talking about inadvertent mistakes. I'm not talking about vandalism or terrorism or all that other stuff. That's sort of, you know, somebody brings in a bazooka, you know, run for the doors. Uh, okay, and extreme external disturbances. What happened to Fukushima? The tsunami, right? So they built, they built a wall this high, and what they did was they looked at 50 years of, of tsunami data. They didn't look at 1,000 years of tsunami data. The 1,000 years of tsunami data said, we're going to get tsunamis this big. And then they put all their pumps down here, below the wall, so that when the tsunami came, it just overwhelmed all the electronics equipment and all the pumps, and we had a nuclear problem. Right? So we, we do have to deal with extreme disturbances. I don't think we're going to get that in the course, but when, you, when you're building a plant and when you go out to engineering practice, you're going to have to think about those as well. OK, so those are factors. The consequences of things would be hazards. Again, if it's hazards, next uh, topic in the course. Equipment damage is, is costly. So you've done some cost estimating. Now you kind of see the cost, you know, a, a $3 million compressor. Ooh, whoever thought a machine would cost that? Or a $4 million furnace. You know, you look in your basement and you see this little furnace that's heating your house. And you replace it for maybe $5,000. A fired heater in and a, and a chemical plant can be $4 million. And you can burn it down. I've seen several. Okay. So off-specification material, which we may have to destroy. If you make off-specification -spec plastic, you may just have to big a, dig a hole in the ground and bury it. There's nothing. You can't unpolymerize things so well. Okay. So that can be a real problem. It will certainly be a cost. And some things just happen, right? So we're going to have fault heat exchangers. So things will, are going to build up. Catalyst is going to deactivate over time. There's not much we can do about those. To stop it, there are some things, and we'll do those. But we have to make sure our design can still operate at the end of those two years with that heat exchanger that's fouled. Or what? What if, I, what if we say, well, look, you're going to operate for two years, but in six months, that's going to be fouled. Our chemists, our corrosion chemists tell us that's going to be fouled to the point where we can't transfer the heat. Then what do you have to do in your design? Yes? Okay, so we could have another one. Or, that's, and that's a good answer. It's a perfectly legitimate answer. Or... We have to figure out some way that we can clean it while the plant's running. Okay, so we either have to replace it or repair it while the plant's running. And we're going to see some things. And obviously, that's not something that's going to happen automatically. I mean, you can't drive your car along and say, I want to change the spark plugs. You know, you've got to stop. 
Okay, so let's do, what, what about responses? I'm going to do this from the bottom because I don't think I was thinking when I made the table. All right, so the most extreme situation is we're going to have to shut the plant down or part of the plant. Now, the worst situation is the whole plant. Now, if something happens in, way in the beginning of the plant and I don't want to shut all the, the entire plant down, what could I do? Yes? Okay, so I could put part of this on recycle uh, if I have that option. And what's another? That's a good out. That's a good answer. And what's another one? Okay, that's a very good answer. Uh, that isn't in my slides. Uh, but if, if it's on the market and you can buy it, and what's another thing you could do? So this, the flow stopped here, but I want to keep the flow going for the rest of the plant. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to have some inventory. It could be solid, it could be gas, it could be liquid. So I could build some inventory in different places. And that sort of decouples faults. Right? So I can, I can if, if I can do this repair quickly enough, then I can get the plant up and running again, and I'll just process the, you know, the material out of the inventory. The inventory will go down, and then later the inventory will go back up again. Right? So those are very good answers, all three of them. Okay, so repair during operation, replace during operation, definitely we have to design to make sure that that's possible. And we'll see some ways to do that. And then finally, there's the null hypothesis or whatever. We have a statistician in the room here who really likes it. So don't do anything. Things are going to happen. So the catalyst is going to deactivate. There's no, nothing else we can do. So we may have to load extra catalyst in. So in the beginning, we have more catalysts than we need. But by the end, when the activity is down, we have that. Or maybe we can raise the temperature. When the catalyst activity goes down, we can raise the temperature. So we're going to have to know something about the chemistry and, and the process equipment. So things do happen to degrade the plant. We're going to have to, in some cases, we're just going to live with it. And that's because the cost of repair is going to be uh, much lower than shutting the plant down. OK, so that's qualitative stuff. Now we give you some equations. You love equations. OK, so reliability. We talked about it in words, which is more important. So reliability is 1 minus the number of failures that occur when we sample our system divided by the total number of outcomes, the number of batches we make or the number of days of operation, whatever it happens to be. Okay. The probability of failure is that some of the probability of failure and the probability uh, of reliability, of being reliable, equals one. So we're dealing with a very simple world here. Either the heat exchanger works or the heat exchanger doesn't work. So in a sense, if, if we're talking about a leak, that's probably true. It either leaks or it doesn't leak. But if we talk about heat transfer rates and heat, tra heat exchanger coefficients and so forth, th the world isn't quite this simple. Some of the mathematics we're going to use says it's, it either transfers the heat or it doesn't transfer the heat, but that's not true. We know that the following factor will influence the, the rate of heat transfer. Okay? Then we have the failure rate. The failure rate is <coughs> the form in which we get most of our data. So it's the number of failures per unit time, a failure rate, divided by the number of items at that time. So the, the normal units, the typical units, I should say, are failures per million hours of operation. Failures per million hours of operation. So normally, we're gonna, if we're, well, I'll show you some tables. Uh, and there's a, there's a, a chapter on the internet uh, that has a lot of references for data. The key limitation in this whole field is, is, is data. And uh, so I'll mention what's going on with that. Okay? So this is the failure rate. 
Now, if I plotted the failure rate versus time, so this is a brand new clean pump or whatever, heat exchanger, reactor, vessel, pipe, and it, we're going in time in that direction. We're using it the whole time. It's an operation. What do you think that curve will look like? Take 30 seconds, turn to your friend. If the person next to you isn't your friend, you can pretend, okay? You two guys, you gotta pretend. All right, so, and talk about what the shape will be. Okay, what do you, th somebody, somebody give me a, a curve. What do you think the curve's gonna look like? So where's, is it, and initially, is it gonna go up or down or stay the same? It's gonna go up. Okay. So you're saying it's gonna start to go up, and then what happens? Does that? No. <laughs> okay. So let's look at, let's look at, first of all, what's called the bathtub curve. This is a theoretical curve you see in every textbook. And then we're going to ignore it from then on. So the bathtub curve. There's a constant rate in the middle if you follow the bathtub curve. So there's a, a constant rate. So that means it's, it's entirely chance. So what do you think happens near the end? Things wear out, right? So we're going to be in the, we have the wear out phase. And what about the beginning? <laughs> we're going to have the break in or the infant mortality phase. It's a gruesome term. So the concept behind this is there are probably a lot of manufacturing faults and installation faults that occur. So we're going to have a high rate of failure in the beginning. And once we get rid of all those, then we're going to have a constant rate. And then at the end, things are going to start wearing out. So that's the theory. It sounds so good. You have to believe it, right? That's, that's the theory. So let's look at some data. Now this data is old, but uh, it's published. And everybody who works in the field uses the same data. Oop. So is that realistic? OK, so where's the bathtub curve on the data? Hmm? E, the one on top. So how much, how many of the failures in percentage follow the bathtub curve? you know, below 5%. It's a beautiful theory, but it doesn't work. We have those. So, so we have the, the bathtub curve, which is in every textbook. And unfortunately, the textbooks often stop there. The, the books talking about the engineering practice don't. So look at down here. The vast majority have no wear out, have no wear out, and the, a large percentage have, have continue, completely constant failure rates. Some have a burn-in phase where you, well, turn it on and wait for a while and see if it breaks, whereas the others are, are manufactured to a very high specification, and, and so when they're delivered, they're the very best and the rate starts to go up until it gets to an increase. 
So basically we're saying there is no wear out. That mo almost all of these faults are due to random failures in either, usually in either manufacturing or in maintenance. So, so somebody does an oil change and doesn't do it correctly, then you start introducing faults. So maintenance is a good thing. You do too much of it, you start introducing faults. So for a large percentage of the, the data, we have a constant uh, failure rate. And that's surprising. Can you give any reason why that's true? why there's no wear out. These two have wear outs and look at they're they're for most the navy seems to have some problem. Something but um, well the wear th that's true. That's true. Of course if if it fails before we're going to fix it. But why doesn't the rate start to go up near the end? Yes. Yeah, we're going to talk about maintenance. One of the stages of maintenance is a, is a monitoring, a predictive monitor, monitoring. So you predict faults before they occur. So that could be one of the reasons. And this is only a hypothesis on my part, that people just take the equipment out of service. So we're not, you're not going to fly a, a 727, Boeing 727 that was made in 1959 or 1960, because it's out of service. If, you, if they kept flying them until they crashed, you know, we'd all be disappointed, wouldn't we? So there's going to be, at some point, we're going we're to either take the entire piece of equipment out of service, or through maintenance, we're going to have changed all of the parts of something small and simple like a pump. So that maybe, the, maybe that's the reason why wear out doesn't actually occur at a high rate here, okay? Uh, still surprising to me, but that's what all the data says, okay? So rather than the bathtub curve in our mind, we're gonna basically have a, a, a constant failure rate model in our heads. Uh, I, you don't have this picture because I, I, I don't have the copyright permission on it, but I can show it to you. That's what the law says, but you can't get your hands on it unless you go to the library and read a book. <laughs> Don't look at your computer in the library. Read a book. It should be a requirement for the course. Okay, so here's what. Th this is in failures per million hours. Over here is uh, not unreliable, and over here is very reliable. So this is 10 to the minus 4 failures per million hours. Over here, that means one failure for every billion hours. That's, that's, that's very reliable. So what do you expect to be over here? Well, things that don't break, like pipes. Once we put a pipe together, it's going to be very reliable. Uh, some, elect some simple electronic circuits and wiring are going to be very reliable. So we kind of expect that. Then we, way over here on this side, uh, the data on computers is, this is old data, so the data on computers I, I, I wouldn't count on. Although computers are not very reliable, and when we use them for critical items, we always have special structures for that. Uh, measuring systems, look, they're pretty high, 10 to the, so we have 100 per million hours on measuring systems, so that's like a flow meter or temperature sensor, those kinds of things. Uh, and where are pumps? Okay, fans, blowers, turbines, pumps, rotating equipment, unreliable. See, that's more complicated equipment. There's a, a lot of things going on there. So, so when we think about what could go wrong, and do we have to spend some money to prevent it? We're not going to worry as much about pipes as we do about compressors and turbines and pumps and things like that. Okay. So there's, there's more. This is really old data, but it's, it's a nice little plot to look at. 
There are other sources of data, which we'll talk about. They tend to look like these tables. I'm just going to skip over this. So it gives you failure rates and low and high. Um, OK, so <clears throat> the reliability, if we want to re relate reliability to the failure rate, we can, the reliability through this little simple equation, if the, reli if the failure rate's constant, is the exponential of minus the failure rate times time. And what's the time going to be there? What's the time going to be? The time between startup and shutdown. Right? That's going to be. So you usually hear that called the mission time in this literature. That's because the military and aerospace uh, tend to have developed this technology. And so that's our mission time. Or it might be 40, the time for 40 batches or whatever it happens to be. OK. So the mean time between failures, uh, this is the mean time to failures here. The mean time to a failure, that's from starting with a repaired or new piece of equipment. What's the average time until a failure occurs? That could be much longer or much shorter. As a matter of fact, because it's random, you could put in a new machine and have it fail tomorrow, right? because it's entirely random. But the average time is the mean time to failure, the mean time to failure, and that's one over the failure rate. Right? Simple stuff. Because we're assuming right here now that this is based on that data we looked at, that the failure rates are constant. All right, so something <coughs> that you'll hear uh, people talk about is availability. So availability is the ratio of the time the plant is producing a product to the total time. So the availability is the mean time to failure divided by the mean time to failure plus the time to repair plus the time to wait. So this is the time when you actually get all the parts and all the people together. That's the time to repair. This is the time it takes you to get the spare parts. They may have to be shipped from Germany or who knows what. And maybe your repair crew on average is working somewhere else and it's going to take a day to call them in and, and get them on site to actually do the work. Okay? So that's the availability. That should be very high. So let's think about availability. The equipment uh, availability ha has a high value, 99.9%. Does that mean that the system is working well? Or you can make that 99.99%. What do you think? Or if I told you... Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So the, the message here is no one of these measures by itself is good. We have to have several of them. So I worked in a plant, and before the plant was running, we were testing the, the control computers. And the control computers were failing 100 times a day. And the vendor of that equipment said, well, we calculated the availability. It's very high. You don't have a problem. Because you push the button, and the computer would start again. We're going, what, are you crazy? You know, we can't run, we can't run the plant which, with one shutdown a year, let alone 100 a day. But because of the time to repair, and there was no time of waiting, was so fast that this, this number didn't really characterize the problems that are going on. Okay, so you have to, so we, if we looked at the mean time uh, to um, failure, it would have been less than an hour, and that would have been clearly wrong, that bad. So, so uh, and there are other ones, uh, overall equipment effectiveness. There's a whole bunch of these little metrics. And each one of them has, a, has some truth, and it has kind of a hidden lie in them. So make sure that if you, you know, when you're out there practicing, you don't just calculate one of them. You calculate a number of them so that you, so that you really get a picture of how the system is performing. And the idea behind monitoring these, of course, is if one of them starts to slip a little bit, then you go out and solve the problem. Okay, process structures. So we're going to, we're going to, we put things together. Reactor, distillation tower, you know, heat exchanger. 
what's a, what are good structures and bad structures for reliability? Okay, the first one's series. So if I have a if I have a series um, and each one has reliability, what's the reliability of the overall system given that series? Yep. Okay. That's very good. And what have you assumed? They're independent. Oh, wonderful. You could teach this course. <laughs> so, so it's the product. It's sort of like flipping coins. What's the probability of flipping a heads? 50%. What's the probability of flipping two heads in a row? 25%, right? And so forth. So, the probability or the, the reliability, which is the probability of success here, is the product of the reliabilities in that system. And we have lots of we have lots of series systems. We're going to talk. We're going to look at a couple. Right. So, it says no common cause failures. Well, wow. what's a common cause failure? Sorry? Um, it might be, but let's think about the whole chemical plant. What's something that could cause the whole chemical plant to shut down? Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a common cause failure, electricity. Shuts the whole plant down. Common cause failures are really bad. So wherever we have a supply of things so like power or steam or fuel, we want to make those especially reliable. And we'll see a, an example of that. So it could be human error, and especially if you have the same maintenance person working on a whole bunch of equipment. Because if that person makes, tends to make that same mistake over and over and over again, then it's affecting the reliability of each one of those components. And then this equation doesn't hold anymore. So to make, but to make this equipment or this equation hold, otherwise it gets worse even, uh, we have to make sure that whatever's necessary to keep this equipment reliable is ex more reliable than everything else. So we're going to have Fukushima had battery backup, immediate battery backup, and then they had generators to generate electricity. But what happened? Yeah, the water came in and flooded the generators. So there, there was a common cause failure that took out all of the generators and some of the batteries and all of the electronics. What did the operators do? They ran out to their cars, got the batteries out of their cars to power the key electronics. And that kept them going for a couple of hours. Okay, so here's a plot of the number of elements in a series and the reliability of each of the elements. Uh, what we're assuming here is that the red line, all of the reliabilities are 0.99 and so forth. Okay? That tells us that things get bad fast in a series system. And we have a lot of series systems. Let's do one more. Oh, okay, what are, what are some series systems? I'm just going to show you a couple. So here's, a, here's a, a toy chemical plant where we have a feed tank, a pump, a valve, a heat exchanger, a reactor, a pump. Here's a series system. How many components do you think are in that system that have to work properly? There's all of these little bits and pieces, so it may look like there's 10 or 15, but there are probably several hundred. We think about the detail. So let's think about the detail of one, one little, you loved process control, I know you did. Who taught, you taught it. Huh? I said, Dr. Schwartz, you didn't have Dr. Schwartz. I know you love process control. 
you think about every one of those control loops in that plant has a sensor, a transmitter, wires, A to D converters, computers. So there's about 10 elements in each one of those loops. If we went back to that plant, when we put the control on it, we'd have maybe eight or 10 loops, right? There. So we've got 80 right there. So it's really important to have high reliability of the equipment in a series system, or we've got to make sure that we can repair that system without shutting the plant down. OK, we're going to do parallel structures, but not now. Right? We're going we're to break. I know you want to keep going. I'm not going to let you. You have to leave.